Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah good. Thank you. So, uh, this was announced as a surprise talk, which was my fault because I was terribly late uh, sending to the organizers the title and abstract of, of, that, of that talk. And so, in expiration, they just said, well, it, we announce it, can I announce it as a surprise talk? Then, I, once I saw that, I moved and said, well, I have to think of something to talk about. So, I sent them something, but then they left it as surprise. Uh, so, the surprise is direct, sti direct style uh, Scala. Uh, uh, that's what I want to talk about. I talk about some of the things that we have done and more of the things we have planned. Uh, so this is very much sort of a work in progress uh, talk. So what, what, I'm, what is the trends that we are looking at right now? So I think what we're looking at is that there's a increasing support of uh, asynchronicity in programs and that leads to new forms of control. Uh, so first there's a widespread, almost universal support for async await, which is uh, a bit limited because it's limited to a single function. You can essentially mangle your code so that you can suspend in a function. But runtimes also get better support for the real things. And the real thing here, I mean fibers, so green threads, very lightweight threads, or even better, continuations. Now, continuations are a very old concept that has been in functional programming since the 80s, at least. Uh, uh, but they have been sort of hibernating a bit. People haven't been looking at them, and they are coming back uh, in, a, in a big way now. So I'm going to fill you in what, what they are and what one can do with them. So examples of things that are currently have uh, already established are uh, Go routines, which is a form of very lightweight thread in, in uh, Go, uh, Project Loom, the virtual threads, Kotlin coroutines, OCaml and Haskell have delimited continuations. OCaml had them for a long time, Haskell recently acquired them. And there's also very interesting research languages such as Effect or Coca that explore this idea of algebraic effects, which is very much tied to, to this idea of continuations. So the thesis of my talk, what I hope to convince you, is that this will have a deep influence on the libraries and frameworks of the future. And in particular, it's very, very attractive now to go back to direct style. Uh, what is the opposite of direct style? Well, that is continuation passing style and typically a control monad. So but that's what essentially a lot of libraries do now. Cat's Effect, Zio, uh, Monix Task, essentially they're all monadic libraries and the argument will be that essentially in the future this style might no longer be that relevant. So that's a strong thesis, I know, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to back it up for you. So how will this influence Scala in the future? So there will likely be native foundations for direct style uh, and ideally delimited continuations. That's what, what we're currently working on on Scala native. One can also make do uh, with fibers or virtual threads like on latest Java. And if one has nothing, then there are very interesting uh, ways to actually do bytecode or source rewriting uh, for older Java versions or JavaScript. So we're working with uh, Xavier Functional on the bytecode on source rewriting, and we're working with Virtus Lab on the uh, delimited continuations for Scala Native. So there's, there's some momentum going on. And the thesis is this will enable new techniques for designing and composing software. I'm going to talk about that mainly. And I believe also there will be generally a move away from monads as the primary way of code composition. I mean, monads are, of course, useful. They're ubiquitous. They're everywhere. But the question is, do you need them for control? And the answer is, well, there will be alternatives in the future. So let's have a look at these alternatives. So building a direct style stack. Uh, so let's start from the, from the simple baby steps uh, and build up. So uh, the, the, the simplest baby step is to just have boundary and break. And uh, in fact, that's already shipped. That will be in uh, 3.3. Uh, 3. And essentially, the, all that can do is uh, it is a saner alternative for non-local returns. I'm going to show you what it is exactly. On top of that, you can essentially have new ways of error handling. Uh, on top of that, you uh, can, if you're lucky, get uh, continuations or suspensions if the runtime gives you the right thing. And if you have either suspensions or fibers, then that gives new way to uh, build concurrency libraries on top of that. And uh, so what we ha currently have is the first step has shipped. Uh, 
uh, error handling is enabled. It's not yet in the standard library because the standard library is frozen to 2.13, but everybody can very easily implement it. Uh, and suspensions and uh, the concurrency library designs are both work in progress. So warm up, boundary break, what is it? Well, it's simply a cleaner alternative to non-local returns which, which will go away. So in Scala 2, when we had non-local returns, they are deprecated in 3. What's the alternative? We had, we did something very, uh, a rush job, uh, frankly, to do something that sort of replaced it, but it wasn't very good, and now we have something which is much better, and that's this boundary break. So that ships in 3.3. So uh, to see what it does, is it pays to look at this function first index. So it's a function, you, well, you, you look at the element in the list and you give the first index where the element appears in the list. Uh, I know there's a function in standard library to do that, but let's say you have to do it by hand, uh, typical student job, then the students would all reach for non-local return, uh, that uh, uniquely, because that's what, they, what they're used to, they traverse the list, they, and to say when they, when they found the element return. So non-local returns go away, what do you do? Well, what do you do now is uh, you establish a boundary here, and uh, then you go through the list, and if you found the element, then you break with the value of the index. And if you didn't find it, you return minus one. So boundary establishes a boundary to which you can return with a break, and the break can also transport a value. Okay, so, so far this is uh, very pedestrian, and one cannot really see what, 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 what one can do with it. But uh, notice that in the essence what we do is similar to what exceptions do. So what we do is we have a stack and then uh, there's a boundary which establishes a limit on the stack and then we go on and down there uh, we have a break and that returns a value x directly to the boundary and forgets about one segment of the stack. So we have a segment of the stack which essentially skip and forget about. So how is that, uh, uh, what's the API of that? Well, it's actually fairly simple. So there's an object boundary. It has an apply method. So that's what you essentially call when you, call, when, when, when you write boundary. Um, the apply method gets a body which takes a label. So a label is essentially something which represents that boundary as an implicit parameter. So this question mark arrow, that's these context functions in Scala 3, they come in really handy because it means you don't need, really need to write the label in the boundary. The label is completely implicit. Okay, so we have the body, and what does break do? Well, it uh, uh, takes the label and it essentially throws a break exception. Uh, and what the apply method of the boundary does is essentially it has a try that catches this exception, checks that it's the right label, and if it's the right label, then, uh, then it's, yeah, continue, and otherwise it rethrows the exception. So the important thing here is the label. So the label, in a sense, is a capability that enables a break. So you can break as long as you have the label. And the label gets generated here by the apply method, by the boundary. So you can break immediately in, uh, in, in a boundary, like we've seen here. But you can also break elsewhere, provided you have the label. You have the right label, you can break. So a label gives you the right, the right to break. OK. So how is this implemented? Well, we have tried very hard to produce as efficient code as possible. So if the break appears in the same stack frame as its body, then we use a jump. Uh, so it's, it's, it's just a go-to. And otherwise, we use a fast exception that's, that does not capture the stack trace. So uh, exceptions are uh, known to be slow, but that's mostly because they Give, they capture a long stack trace to show you. So if you avoid that, then uh, what uh, a quote from the JVM team, an exception, throwing and catching an exception is about as expensive as three virtual method calls. So not very much. So it's, it's actually very reasonable uh, if, you do, if you have this optimized version of exceptions. <coughs> and here, the good thing is a stack trace is not really needed, you could argue, since we know the exception will be handled. You, have, uh, you can essentially do a break only if you have a label, and you have a label only if there's a boundary to catch the exception. So everything is fine. We don't really have the, uh, the, the problem of uncaught exceptions. Well, footnote, to be 100% sure this needs capture checking, but I'm not going to talk about this today. So that's essentially the, 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 ca the caveat. But uh, to be uh, in, let, let's say for 
all normal cases, you don't need that, and it's fine. They're, they're, they're very, they're, the errors you could make are fairly, uh, fairly rare. Okay, so that's boundary break, and it's not, it hasn't been much yet. So what can you put on top of that? So what you can do is you can use it as a basis for flexible error handling. So where one typically would use uh, an, a monad over option or things like that. So um, here's an, another little program, first column. It takes a list of lists of Ts, and it wants to give you all the first elements of these lists. Uh, but of course, that might not exist, because one of the lists might be empty, then you can't do anything. So it will give you back an option of list of T. And the way we do that is we say optional. So that's another prompt, another boundary, you could say. Go through the list and map have head option. So you get each time an option. Well, now you have to strip the option and sort of mangle it with the list. So that, that starts, you start to essentially sweat and think of higher order uh, operations. What is it? Is it always traverse or what? Uh, here you just add a question mark. And what the question mark says is essentially, if it's a sum, then uh, you just strip the sum and put it in the list, like here. If it's a none, then you return that none to the optional and finish early uh, with, with the none. That's all it does. Okay, uh, and I, I should say that is uh, very much uh, borrowed from the way Rust does it, and uh, Rust people very much like their error handling that way. So essentially that was a suggestion by Rex Kerr, which we picked up and said, well, we uh, can actually do this in Scala very nicely. And in fact, we can do much more than Rust, because in Rust you couldn't actually do this spe specific thing because you can't get out of a higher order function call. It has to be really in the, in the, in the stack frame of the thing. So here uh, we don't have any such restriction. You can uh, call uh, the, the question mark anywhere where you again have, have a label. <coughs> so here's how the optional would be implemented, and that's, I said, that you can implement. It's not in the standard library yet, uh, because it would be new functionality. So uh, here the apply of optional is again a boundary, and the body just returns a sum. The body says, well, I'm, I succeeded. I got to the end of the body. Let's wrap the result in a sum. But at the same time, I provide a label for none to the body. I say, well, you can at any time get out quickly with a none. And the question mark then does precisely that. It takes the label and it says, well, if my result is a sum of x, then return the x, strip the thing. And if it's none, then break with none. So if you go back here, the question mark would say, I get a sum of head option, strip it and put the element in the list. I get a none, return, break to the, to the optional uh, in, in, the, in the outer context. So, and that's of course, that's for option, but you can think of analogous implementations for any other error or result type. So you can uh, think of that uh, as a possibility for either, uh, or uh, you can invent a new type, which I would prefer, uh, which is similar to Rust's result, which has, doesn't have the idiosyncrasies of either. And uh, so for me, the ideal way of error handling would in fact be result plus question mark. Okay, <coughs> so <coughs> let's go to the next stage, suspensions. <coughs> so here you saw the, uh, the original stack uh, 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 diagram for break. So we have a boundary and here we, we had the break, but now we suspend with the function f. So what happens here is actually that we would take the stack frame of the suspension and put it on the side, put it in the heap somewhere as an object. So now our our continuation, as we call it, the, the remainder of the stack up to the boundary becomes an object itself, a suspension, how we call that. And <coughs> what we return instead, uh, so we return immediately to the boundary with the value of f, which is, was the part of the suspend applied to the continuation. So we get the continuation, we mangle it a little bit, we do something with it, we return that immediately to the, to the, uh, to the uh, boundary, and that's it. But we keep the uh, continuation on the side, so we could come back to that. That's the, uh, that's the nice way to do this. So this, in, a, in an essence, is the idea of delimited continuations. Delimited continuations, I think, have been suffering a lot uh, because of terminology. So uh, uh, this uh, technically is reset shift zero, if you can, uh, can, if you can, uh, if you know what that is. Uh, there are others uh, operators, but that's that, that's the one we use here. Uh, but we're gonna not going to call it reset shift zero. We're going to call it th th this way. So we have a suspension 
And the suspension is basically just a function from T to R, so you need you see the signatures of the of the type parameters, which is revealing minus T plus R, uh, and uh, that function's apply method is called resume. That's when we essentially resume the continuation. So we pass it an argument of type T, and we return to the boundary uh, uh, the result of type R. So suspend then takes uh, the body. Uh, that's essentially this, uh, this mangling function, which takes a suspension and returns an R directly. And um, it, to do that, it, it needs a label of R. Uh, yeah. And suspensions are quite powerful because it turns out they can, at the same time, express algebraic effects and monads, which are essentially the two pillars of uh, control and error handling and asynchronous uh, computation. In, in, in functional programming, and suspensions can express, in fact, both. So um, to s let's have a look at algebraic effects. Uh, so we have a super easy introduction. We want to do generators. Uh, who, who knows Python generators? So yield thing, yeah, exactly. So this is a program directly taken from, from Python. So we have a generator. And here, we, we don't have yield. We have produce. Uh, yield is a keyword, so we would have to put it in backticks. And <coughs> uh, essentially, we just write uh, a program that gives, at certain points, gives us certain results. And the generator itself, the way we model it, is essentially as a simplified iterator. That's just for presentation. So it doesn't have <coughs> has next and next. It has next option, which returns an option of t, a sum if there's something, and then and then none if uh, the the generator is at the end. It would be very easy to turn that into an iterator. Okay. So, but how do we implement uh, a generator, a general generator like that? So let's put this. Uh, uh, let's let's make a slightly. Uh, Comp more, comp more uh, difficult example. So what we want to do is we want to have a generator that can do the following, that can give us, given a tree, all the leaves of the tree in an iterator, or in a generator, rather. So the way we would do that is we would have this recursive function leaves. It gives us a generator. And the way it does that, it calls generate. So that's our boundary here. And uh, then in generate, there's a recursive method, recur, that says, well, if I have a leaf, then I produce uh, the element of that, uh, the, the value of that leaf. And if I have a, uh, an inner with a list of nodes, then I do a recur for all the inner nodes. Well, couldn't be simpler than that. Uh, but of course, you can't do that right now because uh, we don't really have these generators. So in the uh, terminology of algebraic effects, you would say the generate thing is an effect scope, uh, where and the produce is the effect. So producing is an effect. You produce a value to your enclosing generator. Okay. So how do how would you implement that? So the way you would do that, you would have a trait call it also produce, which has this produce method, and then uh, the generate method uh, creates a new generator which has. Uh, the implementation of this next option is just it takes a step. And step is uh, a function that gives us the next value and that we have to implement. So how could we implement step? Well, here it is. It, we can use uh, a boundary and suspend. So uh, the, the idea is we need to produce a produce type. Uh, sorry, this, this should be produce of t. Uh, it was can, can produce before. So we give you a... Uh, uh, a, uh, a value, an evidence of produce, with the following implementation of produce. So here we suspend and say, uh, what does we do we do with the suspension? The suspension is called k, because people typically call continuations k. That's, uh, that's uh, an old uh, convention. So what we do is we, we, you say, well, resume the continuation, but not right now, only when you take the next step. Because at the current step, I already know what I will return, namely a sum of x. So I, here, here's my value. So, and the next time you call uh, produce, then uh, here's the step function that you should call. That's all there is to it. And uh, the, the main body of the boundary is just the body it was given, and we return a none at the end to say, well, there's nothing more. So it's a really simple, once you have suspensions, it's really simple to actually code up such things, which are very, very hard otherwise. I mean, the generate implementation, even in, in Python, which is very limited, uses this device, which essentially does a state machine of everything. But what, what these things essentially do is they encode a limited version of continuations. So once you have continuations, you have everything. 
Okay, so summary for algebraic effects. Effects are typically methods of effect traits, and handlers are implementations of these effect traits. The handlers are passed as implicit parameters. Uh, they can abort part of a computation via break, or they can also suspend part of a computation as a continuation and resume it later. That's why algebraic effects are often called resumable exceptions, because you can you throw an exception, then you can choose whether you want to abort, not come back, or whether you want to essentially resume. But it turns out that essentially the whole exception boilerplate gives a lot of overhead also to algebraic effects, and that it's much simpler if you just go back to the, to the fundamental basis of continuations, because that's really all we need. We don't need uh, elaborate hierarchy of uh, uh, effect types and essentially effect handlers that, that represent these things. I think that those, those detract and uh, make, make code rather more brittle. Okay, so how can we implement suspensions or continuations? Well, we can do it directly in the runtime, as I showed you in the designs. We literally take part of the stack, copy it elsewhere, put it back. Uh, we can also do it on top of fibers or virtual threads that require some compromises, uh, uh, but, but it works. Um, to some degree. Uh, we can do it by bytecode rewriting. The library is called like Java control, or there was Quasar before that do that. Or we can do it by uh, rewriting the source uh, to actually support these things. And there are a range of really fascinating techniques. So I could talk for hours uh, about that, but I don't have the time. OK. so. What about monads? I say we can do everything with a monad. I don't have the time to explain it in detail. I just go back to ancient histories. Monads were invented 30 years ago. Uh, so no, the monads existed much longer, but they were proposed for programming languages 30 years ago by Phil Wadler. Uh, he had gave a famous talk about essentially proposing monads for Haskell, and the talk ended with the word Haskell is the essence of ML. What he meant by that, that, that ML before, or SML, not machine learning, but the language, they had continuations before, uh, from, from the start, basically. And he showed how to do continuations in a continuation monad. So we sh we, he showed, well, everything that is an ML that, is, uh, that, that we don't have, we can now do with monads. So Haskell is the essence of ML. So a year later, Andrei Filinski came back and showed that every monad can be expressed in direct style using just what he called control continuations, which came to be known as delimited continuations, or what we call suspensions. And he ended his talk then with the, with the quote, ML is the essence of Haskell, because any monad that you have in Haskell, we can actually do with our continuations. So my take is designs on continuations are much simpler usually to compose than monads. We know monads, uh, monads don't compose. You need monad transformers or finally tagless or any of these fairly heavyweight patterns. But continuations uh, compose beautifully. So there's, there's, a, there's a much better, better uh, 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 techniques to be had here. OK, so let me get to the last part of the talk. And that's what can that do for libraries. And here I, it's, it's very uh, prelimin preliminary, I should say. But the idea is that with suspend or fibers, we can now implement lightweight and universal await uh, that can be called anywhere. So that means that our whole world can be turned upside down. Uh, previously, with futures, we, you, we said we should never wait for a future, right? Uh, that's, that's dangerous uh, because you block the thread, and therefore it's made very hard. You have to give a time out, and you have to, yeah, essentially, there are warning bells everywhere. So now the new thing is you should absolutely wait for a future. That's the way to do it. Uh, so waiting for a future will be very cheap and very, very simple. So here's a, here's a way to, to you, you can do that. So here we have a future. So we said we want to read, let's say, two channels, C1, C2, and uh, return the sum of what we read. So we make two futures. And so to try to read the one, uh, try to read the first, try to read the second. And we return the sum of the values of the future. So value is essentially a form of waiting. Wait for the result. If the result is an exception, rethrow it. Otherwise, uh, take the value. And what this also shows is what uh, is called structured concurrency. Uh, that's essentially a guarantee that the two local futures, F1 and F2, complete before the sum as a whole completes. And this might mean that one of them needs to be canceled. Let's say F1 returns with an exception. Then you don't need F2 anymore, so you need to cancel F2 at that point. So uh, essentially, structured concurrency implies cancellation. <laughs> 
So if you compare that with the status quo, then that's what it would look like. And that is a, is a bit weird, I, I think, uh, because it's, uh, it mixes direct style and monadic style in an awkward way. So you, you start these futures in direct style, they start executing, but then if you want to do anything with it, you have to use monadic ways. You have to use a map and a flat map to compose them. And I can very well understand to say, well, this is a bit awkward and let's go full way and avoid futures uh, and go to tasks or something like that that are essentially lazily started uh, because this sort of combination is, is, is really awkward. But once, <coughs> once you don't need the monadic composition anymore, it makes perfect sense. It's actually the completely natural way to compose functional computations in parallel. So what we have been working on is what I call a straw man. So that's essentially a thing to, to be knocked down by uh, anyone, by you, uh, if you play with it. Um, uh, it's an early stage prototype of a low level concurrency library in direct style. And it has as main elements uh, futures, uh, the primary active elements uh, in the way that I showed you, channels, which are the primary passive elements, <coughs> and then an interesting combination of the two, which is called an async source which uh, it can be both a future and a channel. We say, well, it really doesn't matter whether I wait for on a channel or I wait on a future. In both cases, there's some computation that will give, give me something. And uh, so I should have a common abstraction that, so that for instance, I can have a, a select where I wait on some futures or a channel or a timeout or things like that. I should be able to mix things that way. And to be able to do that, you always need to have an async context, which is, again, a capability that allows a computation to suspend while waiting for the result of an async source. So you need to get that capability, and that capability has runtime implications. So the, it's currently under LAMP EPFL async, and async is, is probably not the final name. That's just a working, working name right now. OK, so let's have a look at how futures would look like in this thing. So a future in this library is an async source of the family result type tri of t, as, as usual. And it's also cancelable. I, I won't talk about cancellation here. Uh, uh, so the primary method of a future is uh, the result method, which returns the, the tri that the future uh, 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 the, that, that, that the future computed. And you can also force the tri with a value, which is just result.get. <coughs> and the result method then is just essentially the await method of my async context. So async knows how to wait. <coughs> so I wait <coughs> on, <coughs> oh, sorry, on the current future. So async again is a capability that allows to suspend in an await method. Okay, what is async then? The, so the async trait is essentially the effect trait, and waiting is an effect in our terminology. Uh, so it has as primary method this await method, which takes an async source and waits for it. Uh, and it has other methods to schedule things and to cancel things, which I, uh, are not important uh, for the, uh, at first reading. OK, so what is an async source? Uh, so async source is a common supertype of futures and parts of channels. They're, they're the primary means of communications between asynchronous computations and what's important, they can be composed in interesting ways. So for instance, we can define map and filter on an async source. So map would just map the, uh, the values of an async source with a function f, and filter would essentially only pass on things that pass a predicate. And we can also uh, raise a number of async sources. So if you have a, set of, uh, a, a, a variable number of async sources, we can say, well, pick the one that gives a result first and forget about all the other ones. So that's essentially a, a race gate. So all these things are async sources. And therefore, we can wait on a race of several async sources, which might each be mapped in filters of things like that. So for instance, that lets us define either uh, so the either method should take two sources and it gives, should give, give me left of the result of the first source if it comes first and right of the result of the second source if that comes first. And that can be achieved simply by putting these two things in a race. So I just, just say I, I take one or the other. So essentially that gives me a lot of power already for the typical operators. So here you, you, you things you might want to see uh, for futures. So the zip operation, which essentially uh, takes the uh, combines the results of two futures in a pair. So what that would do is it would say, well, let's wait for either F1 and F2. So the either F1 and F2 is my async source. I wait for it. 
then if I get a left with a success of the left source, I say, okay, re let's return x1 and now force the value of the second one. If I get a right, I do it uh, symmetrically. Uh, and uh, if I have a failure, left or right, I throw an exception. Here's the dual, uh, the alternative method, where uh, I, I start with the same way, I wait either, and if I get a success, uh, I uh, return that immediately, and if I get a failure, then I essentially go, go to the other one. Okay, so that's, I'm out of time, but I maybe I take two minutes to, to finish. So you could ask why futures and channels? Uh, I believe it's the simplest way to get parallelism via futures because uh, futures simply define a computation, run it in parallel, and you can wait for the result when needed in its essence. So it's a really nice way to express in particular functional computations that you want to parallelize, which is essentially a very widespread use case for concurrent programming. And channels are of course a canonical way of communication between uh, computations. So the two fit really well together, I think. But normally you would say, well, that's kind of weird because normally when we talk about channels, we pair them with coroutines or something like that, like goroutines have channels and things like that. So why not coroutines? Why futures and not coroutines as the primary abstractions? Well, often, uh, well, basically, always we need to be able to wait for a coroutine's termination. Waiting for a termination is universal. And we also need to be able to handle exceptions that might happen in this coroutine. So if you ignore the two, then you will get a very brittle system. But if you want to do the two, wait for termination and handle exceptions, then, well, that is naturally achieved by a future of unit. That's what it is, right? You can wait for the result, it's a unit, you can throw it away. Or if you get an exception, you get that. So we don't really need a different abstraction. Coroutines are futures of unit. The other question is why an error type that's fixed to try as futures do? Well, I could say, well, that's what futures do, let's keep that, but I'm throwing everything else out of the water, so why keep that? Um, so uh, a common complaint for the current futures is that if we fix the error type to exception, then that makes it very awkward to handle other errors. So then we end up with a future of either and then it gets hard to compose. So for instance, this probably gives you a headache um, or infinite joy, depending on, on your <laughs> genes, I guess. So we have uh, a list of future of result TE. I, I refuse to use either for, for, for errors. I, I think either is terrible. So let me just postulate result instead. Uh, and I want uh, a future that gives me as a result either a list, well, if, if essentially everything gave, gave me back OK for the T, or the error that uh, returned here. So how do I do that? Uh, anybody can quickly, I, I didn't find a solution, so I tried and my head exploded, so it's, it's, it's too hard. Uh, how would I do that with our new abstractions? So here's how I would do that. I would say, well, I want a future, well, here's a future. I want a result, well, here's a result. Uh, I go through the list of uh, uh, futures, I get the value of each of them, the value is a result type, and then I say, tell, tell the result type, well, hey, are you okay? If the result type is okay, it will be part of the new list. If the result type is an error, I go back with the error to the result and return that into, into the future. That's all there is to it. A simple compositions, no traverse or lift is needed. So this is essentially everybody can do that. Uh, and uh, I think it's really the, uh, a good demonstration uh, what the, these, these new techniques can do uh, that, that right now are very, very hard to achieve. So conclusion, I think direct style has lots to offer. Suspensions can express every monad, uh, but they provide much more flexible compositions. And I believe this gives completely new possibilities to express practical foundations for concurrency and async I.O. So I believe the future will be interesting. Thank you.